All right, guys, welcome back to We Talk Money. This show is going to be really fun for me because this is something that I love doing and I know you guys also love doing. That is how to find hot trends and topics early before the masses find them because as investors and entrepreneurs, that's where you can make a lot of money is if you catch trends early and then you get to see them rise to meteoric heights. <laughs> <laughs> like pickleball. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly like pickleball. In fact, if we take a look here, that this is a website that I really like. It's called explodingtopics.com. Mm -hmm. And it uses a little bit of AI, oh but you can God. see pickleball is an example of something that has just exploded in popularity over the past five years. Parabolic. Parabolic, <laughs> yes. But we'll dive into a few different tools and resources, but... I thought this could be a, a fun topic since this is what I'm always asking you guys is like, hey, what's the next big thing, mm -hmm. right? That's that's part of the fun of being an investor, trader, and entrepreneur mm -hmm. is looking for trends early and trying to figure out what's going to pop, what's going to flop, and where the opportunity is. It's a good day for it too because we have the Honey Badger stock, NVIDIA, reporting <laughs> its earnings after hours. And as we know, AI, the big theme of 2023 AI, so far. AI, AI, AI. <laughs> AI, 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 AI. Driving stocks and crypto. If I hear AI or debt ceiling one more effing time, I'm going to lose it. <laughs> oh, well, you shouldn't watch kidding. my You shouldn't watch my recent <laughs> YouTube video. I did watch your YouTube video. It was oh, man, great. Trav, Trav got a video out. Yeah, hey, Trav, he's he's back. Back. he did it, he did it. Everybody back. hound him for yes. more content. I yes. was working on content for another video video yesterday. Yes. Yeah, nice. Can we get a like a hint uh, of the topic? Well, it's about, it's actually about a stock. So okay. a specific stock. Yeah. Nice. So okay. returning to my roots as the stock geek. Love this mm -hmm. for Good you stuff. Good and stuff. for us. Mm -hmm. All right. So what are the big topics? Let's talk about the markets. Let's talk about some news and then we'll dive into today's topic. And we've got a few questions from some of our watchers and listeners. Um, market's actually pulling back today, taking a look at the NASDAQ and the S&P 500. The S&P actually has never been able to break out of multi-month resistance. And along with that, we've also got some weakness here in Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what, what else is going on in the stock world or the macro side. I mean, stocks have been sleepwalking, in my opinion. We had a huge rise in government bond yields last week. And of course, we have the whole debt ceiling fight coming to a crescendo this week, next week, most likely. And yet stocks were just like, we don't give, we don't care. We Honey don't badger. care. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so I was saying, I think last week, or I was saying to somebody this week, even that it was really strange to me. I get that why stocks would ignore the debt ceiling. Because if you go watch that video I did on the debt ceiling on my Stocky TV YouTube channel, plug shameless plug <laughs> <laughs> but if you if you watch that video i looked at the 1995 the 2011 the 2013 debt ceiling crises and strangely enough two out of three of those times stocks did fine and actually didn't really even have that deep of a drawdown at all through the crisis now 2011 was a little different we had stocks down like seven or eight percent before the crisis was resolved and then stocks were down after the crisis got resolved another seven or eight percent they were higher six months later but in that two three week period they were down, and the U.S. debt was downgraded by S&P, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, but yeah, stocks, two out of three of those other, other debt ceiling crises were not really affected. And strangely enough, also, Treasury bonds actually did fine. Like, there was no, like, flight out of Treasuries during those prior three debt ceiling crises. So some interesting patterns there historically, but— is it basically like at this point, the market just looks at that crisis and uh, the, the quote-unquote debt crisis and say— Ah, bullshit. It doesn't really matter. You guys are going to fight about it and then it's going to get figured out. Yes. But the one thing that I do think could be a problem is, of course, when the resolution comes, if the resolution has big cutbacks in government spending in that package, then you could have an effect on the overall economy and you could tip a teetering economy into recession potentially. And that's what that's what happened in 2011. That's why the stock market uh, sold off in 2011 beyond just the reason for the S&P downgrade. It was because we had just come off the GFC a couple of years prior, and we'd had pretty heavy government spending to try to get the U.S. economy back on decent footing. And so 2011, they're like, well, no, we're going to cut spending back heavily. And so the market was like, well, dang, that means that we could be headed for recession. And so that could be a big worry this time if spending gets cut back enough. We don't know yet, right? We'll see what the resolution looks like here in the next couple of weeks. But, but the, the fears of like government default, you think those are overblown? 
I think so. Yeah. I mean, it, it would be, I, I did say over the past few months, there's probably a higher probability this time than in any other prior debt ceiling crisis, just given how hyper-partisan politics have become. And the fact that we do have some fringe elements of both parties kind of pushing obstinate, but there's enough, uh, there are enough uh, reasonable people or I don't know if they're reasonable, but there are enough people that are kind of not in the fringe that will make a resolution happen. Yeah, but I th I think I remember a lot. Was it the last shutdown where like all the national parks closed? Yep. Mm -hmm. And w what else? I, I think like military people yeah, got furloughed, got and so weird stuff can happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't have to be like a, a doomsday scenario uh, or just a no impact scenario, right? There, there's probably going to be some weird stuff that happens, but mm -hmm. you look out far enough, it's really just going to be a blip on the radar. I think so. Yeah. And like you said, that I'm glad you mentioned that because it's important to note that when the X date comes, when the Treasury's general account runs near zero, because we hit the debt ceiling back in January, the U.S. hasn't been issuing net new debt, but the Treasury has been running down its account balances to try to pay for everything. When that hits near zero, which should happen in the, sometime potentially in the next 10 days, but definitely in the next two months, we don't know the exact date, but when that happens, they will need to start shutting down government departments and prioritizing prioritize certain types of spending. My guess is they'll still prioritize interest payments on debt, but they'll furlough workers, they'll shut down government departments, and so mm -hmm. that could happen. Okay. So the market, yeah, like you guys said, I mean, it's kind of been sleepwalking, kind of shaking it off. I mean, stocks have been down over the past couple of days, but there's still, you know, the NASDAQ is still up above the, the breakout level. Obviously, small cap has gotten destroyed. Mm -hmm. Um with when it comes to crypto, one thing I'll, I'll just say is like, are we in an alt, alt season? No, absolutely not. Like <laughs> Bitcoin dominance is still hanging out around 47, 48 um, percent. And anything that has shown strength is just trading scared right now. So like um, something I've been talking about the past couple of weeks is a breakout that I took on Render, which came really close to my stop. And then yesterday was looking like it wanted to break out. And then today gave back like basically all of its gains from yesterday. And so in the crypto market, we're still in just, we're, we're not attracting new capital, mm -hmm. right? Like th things are just really weak and, and slow. And most charts look like dog shit. And the ones that are showing strength just aren't getting those typical like bull market breakout continuation patterns, right? So are we in a rush to, to trade alts right now? No, but I think now is still a good time to be dialed in and have your routine down and go through the process of researching because I think things are starting to heat up and like we're, you know, we're only less than a year out from the next halving, which is historically a great time to be buying. But I just think with alts, you have to be especially careful right now because things are just trading weak. I think overall, we're kind of seeing like grindy price action. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of like, you know, grinds higher and then grinds lower and then retesting these areas just very slow. There's definitely not that fast momentum that we've seen, you know, 2020, 2021. Yeah. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think like a lot of charts are still showing quite intact. Like even looking at this chart, I'm like, okay, that's still intact. And yeah. other stock charts that I'm watching right now, but it's definitely not... It doesn't have that oomph behind it, that momentum that, you know, you want to see. And Render, is this the sympathy play for AI and NVIDIA in the crypto market right now? Basically, yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, GPU stuff and, you know, anything like that that's a, that's a sympathy play or indirectly related to AI mm -hmm. is the stuff that has popped. But it's also stuff that can pull back. 50, 60 percent in like two or three days. Mm -hmm. So you have to be really careful about managing risk right now. Mm -hmm. Are we making NVIDIA calls? NVIDIA <laughs> earnings calls? Let's hear it. Come on, Stock Geek. Oh, well, the fundamentals don't matter right now on NVIDIA. That's the thing. Uh, so it's hard to say. But I think obviously I think the results will look fine. They've got the tailwind of generative AI kind of offsetting weakness that we've seen in gaming and some of the other verticals. Auto's also doing pretty well. So NVIDIA's kind of got some weaker segments right now, but they've got some stronger segments that are holding it up. Now, the valuation is just crazy, and it doesn't make sense to me, but you do have the buzzwords, the tailwind, AI, AI, AI is going to be mentioned over and over and over on the conference call. And so I don't know that unless they massively miss earnings and guide lower, I don't know that it's really going to matter too much because I don't think fundamentals are mattering. They're not what's driving NVIDIA stock right now. Yeah. At some point, the AI, like it's, it, we've been in kind of the initial euphoria phase, right? Since November when uh, ChatGPT came out. 
And eventually, like, reality is going to catch up to the hype. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Th this is something I wanted to ask you guys about because th there is that typical, like, hype cycle, right? Mm -hmm. Where you get the initial push. Thing we saw this in, like, weed stocks, right? Mm -hmm. Things went crazy, then reality hit, and then competition came in. I don't know. AI is, is interesting to me, though, because, like, so much is happening, right? Every day there's dozens of announcements. And so, I don't know. Could this be a catalyst that basically, quote unquote, saves the economy in a way, or does it create more deflationary pressure where like, you know, layoffs and, and those things overwhelm and override the new innovation? It I don't know. That's something I've been thinking a lot about. Feels deflationary, but there could be pulls like puts and takes. But overall, I think this is a deflationary situation, mm -hmm. especially when you think about all of the jobs that actually can be replaced with AI. And I know that's been like a big a big topic of conversation. But like the fact of the matter is it's true. Um, AI is going to be able to do a lot of shit. Yeah. And that is concerning. There will be probably jobs created from it and companies created from it and revenues created from it that, you know, we probably will buy subscriptions, right? We'll be buying whatever AI software comes out, you know, we'll be subscribing to all of them, just <laughs> like we are, we're subscriptioned to death and that'll continue. So it'll bring revenue in an economy, so to speak, and there will be jobs to have to back those businesses, but not as many. Yeah. E even like services are going to get destroyed at like a high level. Like, um, you know, I, I did some research on the jobs that are going to be the most impacted and it's actually a lot of white collar yeah. and specifically like, attorneys, right? Yeah. Uh, so we've got a buddy, Chad, who has a company, Better Legal. Uh, he just launched an AI product. Is that going to eat attorneys' lunches? Yeah. And and I think if not that product, then just all of the products in that space are really going to hit the legal industry hard because, you know, they, they bill per hour and sometimes at very, very high rates. And I'm sure at the very top end of the legal market, that will continue. But there are there's a lot of associate work that can get cut down by by AI and by some of these new products that are coming out. So I think that we'll see a pretty dramatic effect yeah. on billing at the lower and mid tiers in, in the legal profession. And maybe they'll even move away from hourly billing, billing if you can do some of these tasks in five minutes with AI. Yeah, I think we're probably a few quarters away from robots being able to litigate in a courtroom. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, like contract generation, you know, reviewing, mm -hmm. I don't know, documents and websites. Creating and stuff trust. Like that. Creating trust. Like, like a lot of that stuff. Yeah. I, there I, will I, probably still need to be oversight to some degree. But like you mentioned, sure. there will be bill time that's going to be cut. And something that I think is interesting looking at this is going from, you know, right now, white collar workers are the highest paid workers, blue collar are the lowest. I actually can see that changing and going completely opposite. I think we have like a situation where AI can't replace people doing construction, installing cabinets, plumbers, you know, things like that yet. I don't know if that's ever going to happen. I don't, I don't really see that happening anytime soon. So like the blue collar jobs are going to become the high paying jobs because people aren't trained to do them as as much as the the, you know, white collar jobs. Yeah. So we're going to see this this shift where programmers and developers maybe don't get paid as much and plumbers and electricians, they're going to have the six figure plus multi six figure jobs and, and we're as far gonna as have I to know I mean they, they already make good money it's just it's they've been, been stigmatized growing. in the U.S. society where you know we have some friends in Australia where um specifically Leanne one of our friends that's been on the show uh she talks about how like tradies as they call them like people that work in the trades in Australia women actually like those guys when they pull up in their youths aka like pickup trucks like women look at those guys and go man they've got stable income they know how to fix shit like that where here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. it's been like go to college, get a white collar job. Yeah, hopefully that changes. We well, need more. We we need more Mike Rose of the world. You know, like dirty jobs. Right. And, and we have a friend that owns a, a cabinet company, and you know he was talking to us about how he's having a hard time finding and keeping good labor, and they're having to train these people because it's it's hard to find people to come in and know how to properly install cabinets, yeah. for example. And we're Aren't talking they paying like beautiful close kitchens. To, they're, they're paying like close to six figures over, for install, over, over six over, figures to like install 120 cabinets. Wow. salary plus benefits, et cetera. Like, I mean, 
and and that's only going to grow as the uh, lack of people that can do these jobs is out there. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of the same as the CPA industry right now. Like people don't know this, but the accounting industry, the C like they, we don't have enough CPAs Mm. (laughs) and tax professionals. Maybe AI fixes that, but there are certain pockets of the labor market where we don't have the supply, you know, of, of people that can do those jobs and we have the demand. Interesting. So yeah, I see that shift happening between white collar and blue collar. That makes sense. And as far as like overall impact, I think you're right. It probably to me feels more deflationary. I think there's going to be arguments about this for years to come. Mm -hmm. But overall, like you've got a productivity boost from some of these AI tools. Like we're already trying to utilize a lot of them in our work and I'm trying to figure out how to utilize them even in stock research. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm actually, I think, going to do a video on um, there's a whole uh, sec- there's there's a bunch of YouTube creators that are trying to use chat GPT to pick stocks and acting like it's like going to be like the best thing ever for picking stocks. I actually will take the other side of that bet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it can be very helpful in the stock research process. So I'm trying to figure out what tools are going to be good for that. But but yeah, I think ultimately uh, you're, you're potentially going to eliminate jobs very, very quickly though on the other side of this. So productivity boost on one side, on the other side, potentially eliminating lots of work for some people. So if, if that transition happens too quickly, yeah, you could have more job loss than you have productivity increase. So it'll be interesting to yeah. see how it plays out. But yeah, the, uh, I'll do a quick plug too for our buddy Chad's product because I think it's really cool. Like his product, um, I should have mentioned earlier, does like the summarization of legal contracts. Again, I think like something that would take maybe an associate at a law firm that you hire for several thousand dollars to go through an operating agreement for an LLC. Instead, like you plug it into his Chrome extension and it's like, you you can get a human readable version of what the contract is actually saying in like mm-hmm. two minutes, which is pretty cool. So, so basically, it summarizes what the what the product does or what the contract says in layman's terms. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. Awesome. Pretty cool product. So, cool. stuff like that, I think, will just keep coming out. Uh, yesterday, we saw Photoshop has like a new feature. Oh my god, it looks so dope. Oh man, it looks awesome. Yeah, basically, it looked to me like you can just type in a a, a description, kind of like you would Mid Journey. Yeah of what you want to adjust on a given image in Photoshop. And then it just sort of like does it for you. Canva has that too. I played around with theirs, but I've Mm. noticed that Adobe has just higher quality tools. Yeah. Like it's just a little bit better on that side, but Canva has the same thing. And I played with it and I was like, change the picture out with a stock chart and like, boom, it just did it. It was wild. So do you think that eliminates a lot of graphic designers that you would hire and instead pushes that workflow to you. How can it not? Yeah. How can it not? If you can literally have a vision of something, I mean, you still, if you're not a creative person, you're still going to need that professional to help you. Like I am not as creative, so I probably couldn't just come up with something off the top of my head, you know? Sure you could. It's just practice. But, (laughs) but I mean, like the examples that I, that I was looking at, they were like putting a deer in the middle of a road and then like they're replacing the background with like this crazy utopia, you know, looking at background and it just looked super cool. I could have never even prompted that. So that's where like prompting is a skill, right? Mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. that's a requirement to be able to get that awesome picture is you have to know what to prompt. I'm such a nerd for prompting. Like um, now the Twitter algorithm knows that I'll basically bookmark any good thread <laughs> on prompting. And then in Notion or Evernote, I have whole sections just dedicated to prompting of different styles or end goals, like, like learning here's prompts to help get chat GPT to help me learn something or prompting is like a prompt that you can give chat GPT and say, Hey, what prompts could I give mid journey or what prompts could I give you to help me achieve some goal? And so you can use AI to help you become a pro- better prompter. It's like real meta. It's so meta. Yeah, that so is meta. kind yeah. of wild. Oh man, that's so funny. Okay, let's talk about trends. This is uh, this is something that I I love to talk about. I think is probably one of the most fun parts of trading, investing, and starting businesses is like looking at where things are today, looking at existing markets, and looking at emerging products and services and trends figuring out what's going to be the next big thing, right? So um, I just posted this yesterday on Twitter. I said, successful investors and entrepreneurs are always looking for huge ideas before they're popular with the masses. So what are your favorite tools for finding trends early? Here's a few of mine. Um, One that I found recently was explodingtopics.com. 
Um, this was created, where did it go? Yeah, I've been a subscriber of Exploding Topics for about two years or so now. Oh, really? Yeah. No kidding, okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, what was the guy's name? Um, Brian Dean, he's the guy that created Backlinko. I think yep. he recently sold that for several million dollars, but he he created this, and I don't know, Trav, wh why don't you tell us about it since you've got way more experience than I do with it? Yeah, it's a great product. I mean, I, I pay for it and get uh, weekly and monthly emails that basically give us data on what rising topics are, rising companies, and they essentially scrape a bunch of sites, including Google search, to try to find out what's happening with certain trends around certain keywords, companies. And so, yeah, I don't know exactly how many sources they're using now. I think they originally just started with like Google Trends scraping, but then they've expanded it and it's pretty good. Like they've surfaced some some stuff that uh, I would have had no idea about, some very detailed, very specific topics or companies. And so uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's just a great product. And I, I know there's some other competing products like Hustle Trends. Uh, our buddy Sam had started that one a while back and yep. a couple others. There's uh, one other uh, one other big one and I'm uh, Glimpse, I think is the name of it. It's the other uh, big one that I know of that I had subscribed to for a while, but yeah, I mean, um, this is a, a really helpful tool for figuring out like emerging trends, particularly if you're in businesses or trying to start businesses. I think it's super helpful, of course, yeah. for investing, public market investing. The one difficult part is that sometimes if you're on the very front end, particularly of like a micro trend, there's not like a pure play way to invest in it in public markets yet mm -hmm. because it just hasn't spawned enough companies yet that are big enough to go public. But, yep. but nonetheless, like I think it's really really useful for tracking threats to existing public companies and coming up with ideas for products, investing, et cetera. Yeah. You know, it could help like solo entrepreneurs either find trending products to like sell on Amazon or create content around. It could also help like early stage startups, right? Like pre-public stuff, like different industries to invest in. I, I just love the startup industry. And I think I'm going to start becoming more engaged with that because I've been so crypto focused for like really the past five to seven years. That's just been like the main focus that I do want to get more back into like non-crypto startup investing. Um, and then just like, just being in tune with like what's happening, like looking here at like trends.co um, every week they, they do an article and you know, you just learn about like things and, and you open your mind up to things that you wouldn't really think about, like, like marriages, like micro weddings, like this is a trend, right? People are going, why the hell am I going to spend tens of thousands of dollars on a wedding mm -hmm. or like prenups or, you know, we divorce, like people like simplifying the divorce process, <laughs> right? Like just things that wouldn't come to our mind easily. It's like all of a sudden you're aware of these things. And then sometimes you you have like, I, I think James Altucher calls it idea sex, where it's like, you'll have one random idea over here, one random idea over here. And then all of a sudden when you combine those, it's either a new business or a new investment opportunity. So I just like being up to date with a lot of the new trends. It's kind of funny that I'm putting this in practice right now live. So I've been studying the aesthetics industry, which is like basically, you know, getting facials and Botox and stuff. And I just saw on exploding trends, Botox serum. Botox serum. And yeah. I'm what, like, what is this? Is this like Botox? So Botox. This is just like regular just Botox. Botox. Why it's is, going it's going parabolic. Well, yes. This is Botox is something that is just starting to really catch wind across all generations. Like it, for a while, it was looked at as a negative thing because the celebrities took it too far and they looked ridiculous, right? Yeah. Really, it's the filler that made them look ridiculous. But but Botox is trending like literally across. I mean, twenty year olds are getting it now, which is nuts. Are they putting it in like serums you can apply like topically? Is that they, what, I is think? That what that yeah, means? they huh. there are serums that kind of help um, reduce fine lines, like right when you put it on. Mm. I don't know. I have to look at that in terms of. I know that there are, are serums that act like Botox ish, yeah. but nothing works quite like the Botox injection. But that right there is an example of like me, I've been hunting a trend. I've been looking at this trend for a while and researching it. You pulled that up. It's one of the first things is aesthetics. Yeah. Right. So. Well, and, and I think what you do is really valuable because, you know, what, what is it like? I'm going to throw a number out. 80 or 90 percent of professional investors are probably dudes. Mm -hmm. And I, right. I think <clears throat> female markets 
are often overlooked. Absolutely. And like also retail, like there, there's a few examples of like trend spotting that you had early on, like Lululemon, you were super early to Lulu. And Ulta as well. That mm-hmm. was another one. Those Ulta. are like my two biggest Where, where did beauties. you get into Lulu? It was like. Oh, 2017. It was, it was like, like 50, 50 bucks a share. 50 yeah. bucks a share. Yeah, I think in this accumulation range, right? Yep. And then uh, also like even like non-female base, like Square, you were in it like what, nine bucks? Like almost low ticket. Yeah, $9.11 is where I bought Square. Ooh, and I'm nice. still holding that lot. So what, that. what was it that like brought that on your radar? I just looked around and I just saw people using it. And I was like, that's really cool. What the hell yeah. is that? This is what like uh, Chris Camillo or Chris Camillo, mm-hmm. uh, the guy's from Dumb Money, like he's all about this, right? Like so, what does it call it? Social arbitrage. Yeah. Basically like looking in your day-to-day life and one up on Wall Street was about that, right? I was that was a book that you brought that. to our attention a long time ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good old Peter Lynch, one of the OG fund managers from Fidelity back. He was like one of the top performing mutual fund managers in the early 90s. And he wrote a great book called One Up on on Wall Street, I often recommend for, especially for newer investors, it's just a really accessible read. And he talks for at least an entire chapter about finding trends in your own daily life and companies in your own daily life that are on the rise. And so he uses examples like if you'd paid attention enough in the early 90s, you could have found Home Depot, Toys R Us, these stocks mm-hmm. that did super well for a while. And uh, yeah, we actually do an entire, I do an entire section early on in the stock investing boot camp covering some of the ideas from that and talking about how do you generate new ideas? How do you look for new trends? And Lulu is actually a case study in there because we talk about one of the things that we, we noticed both of us when we were talking about it in 2017 was that they were just starting to get into the men's business. Mm-hmm. And so it was like, this was a complete like massive unlock of of half the entire apparel market that they're just starting in 2017. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so things like that and not only identifying the trend, but figuring out how big can it be and can it be meaningful to companies that you can actually invest in is is really what we focus on in stocks a lot. For me, Lulu was always like, why can't this be as big as Nike? Mm. Like, why not? Mm-hmm. Right. And so that's that's what and and now they're into footwear like they're moving they've got the athleisure mm. down they did that well they're still doing it freaking amazing yeah they're reeling in the men right <laughs> now and you both can admit you love your Lulu now they're into footwear so why can't they be as big as Nike maybe not as big but close right I mean they could be I mean they're not really even expanded into Asia yet right they're starting they're just and starting, Asia so Asia is where them. they're starting their expansion. Yep. And I just, I don't know, when I first put on a pair of yoga pants and discovered it and I realized only Canadians know about this, there's like two stores in the U.S. This is an, inc- this is incredible athleisure wear. Yeah. This is a trending category, right? We were just starting to use yoga pants as pants, mm-hmm. as women. And like, so yeah, it's just about... It really, that's been my biggest way of finding trends is just looking around me and asking questions. Like I, if I'm with a teen, I'm asking them. So I'm drilling them (laughs) hard. Yeah. I'm like, you, you've seen it. I'm like, so what's popular? What kind of clothes are you wearing? Where do you like to shop? What do you like? You know, what kind of activities do you like to do? Blah, blah, blah. And like, I am constantly asking questions and I'm constantly looking around at what people are wearing, what people are doing, what people are buying. Um, things that I find that are amazing that I'm like, why isn't this in the US? Oh, it's going to be. So that's how I've kind of found my niche in finding trends. And it is retail heavy, but I've found success in it and I'm keep keep doing what you enjoy. I enjoy it. I love it. I love it. I mean, I, I do think this is like the, the fun, right, is the hunt. And there, there's a couple other tools that uh, I'll bring up. And if you guys have more, feel free to bring them up. But like redditcharts.com. So Reddit is, for anybody that doesn't know, is known as like the front page of the internet. There's a community, aka subreddit for everything. And on this website, you can basically find which subreddits are growing. So usually what I'll look at is like percentage growth, like month over month or maybe on the week or 90 day. And then you can sort out like the the really small ones. So like usually I'll filter out anything less than like either five or 25,000 people. You can see like there's a ton of communities in between five to 25,000 subs. So if you do that, you can have more to sort through. But like j- just showing here, like over the, the past like quarter growth, 
you can see there's some that are like top dark net markets. Okay. <laughs> uh, side hustle. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. Middle class finance. Mm -hmm. Oh. Um, and then you'll get like movies and TV shows. I don't pay as much attention there about like internet culture and memes, animals, you know, um, there, there's just so many like just really interesting things that you can you can see in here. Different trends, you know. AI was a big one over the past couple of months, but um, th this is also a way that you can dive deeper into a topic and then sort like look at the posts. Say like, show me the top post over the last month or this year or all time, and really dial in on what people are looking at in that specific field. Um, and and yeah, and like sometimes a little detail will lead you to like a bigger theme. Like for instance, the other day, you know, our buddy Sam on his podcast, he was talking about the the whole longevity movement. A lot of rich guys are now trying to figure out how they can live longer mm -hmm. and you know beat beat their uh, you know <laughs> or, or reduce their their biological or uh, sorry, it's the difference between their biological age and their like. Uh, what, what did they call it? Like their implied age or whatever yeah. based on there. And, and so, and that's interesting, I think, because you got people like that Brian Johnson guy who who are now going, getting big on YouTube. He's like the 43 year old that does all this weird stuff. What does he spend like 2 million bucks a year biohacking? Yeah. That's wild. Dude, yeah. he takes like so many pills like every morning. It's like 50 pills. I'm like, what about the gelatin in that pills? Doesn't that yeah. like mess up your stomach? Huh. But anyway, he, think apparently he's got it figured out. But like, there's also a bigger theme here, which, you know, the whole longevity <laughs> movement moving from rich people to maybe middle class. What does that mean? What products does that open up? Things like semaglutides and like the whole like weight loss drug trend, like Ozempic and Wegovy and all those that are coming to market. Like they're in shortage now. And the Novo Nordisk stock has been like through the roof. If Pfizer stock is starting to go up on, on news about that. So like that's a theme you can actually play in public markets. That's sort of like a bigger, bigger theme here of people trying to get healthier, increase their longevity, Another trend I'm seeing on that note is um, sobriety. Like yes. Gen Z doesn't drink as much as millennials and millennials yep. don't drink as much as Gen X. So that was one trend that I saw on here. Um, I, I was looking at it yesterday, but they had basically a, a wheel of like different brands that were like booze free liquor. Yeah. And I had a mocktail at Perla's, which is a, a famous restaurant here in Austin. There was like a mezcal. It was a, a liquor free mezcal and it tasted just like an alcoholic beverage. Wow. It was, mm -hmm. it was really tasty. So they're even putting in the, like the bite or they, they call it a, a sting or something. Like, mm -hmm. you know, when you drink <laughs> liquor and you get that sting, yep. they're trying to duplicate that with non-alcoholic liquor. And, you know, the yeah, I think Gen Z is definitely uh, trying to be more healthy. And the, they I guess they've had weed and psychedelics and things like that that we didn't have. Right. Yeah. We didn't have legalized weed when we were when we were <laughs> young. Uh, so that kind of probably helps. But it makes me wonder what kind of trends are going to come from that. Like are sports going to become more popular because people aren't drinking. So they're going out and they're getting into golf or they're getting into pickleball or they're like, do I invest in dicks, sporting goods? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you just that's kind of where my mind starts to run when I'm looking at the trends and how to invest for that trend. Yeah. Here's one that's like a, a pickleball competitor paddle. paddle. Yeah, yeah, which this was huge in Bali. And apparently, yeah, some places like paddles becoming bigger than pickleball. I've never played it. Have you played it? Uh, no, I have not. But I'll tell you my theory, which is Padel will never touch pickleball in terms of market share. You think? It's too hard. It's it. The courts take too much. Co they're too costly to build. Because they have like walls, yes. right? Or mm -hmm. like glass walls yep. or something. Yeah. It looks like an amazing sport. I, I, I do want to play it, but I think it's going to be really difficult to build enough courts to to really sustain like a massive uptick in demand for we, Padel, at least in the a, U.S. I, I think know. you're right. We have a hard enough time in Austin with pickleball courts, mm -hmm. yep. Yep. which is wild. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's been blowing up. So I guess wherever there's a, a court. They'll they'll have access to it, but yeah, the I guess the the draw to pickleball is it's so easy to play. Like all you need is half of a tennis court, mm -hmm. and the the nets are super easy to throw up. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Um, Creatine okay. gummies was another one I saw the other day. That uh, that was an interesting one. They're basically making gummies out of everything now. Like mm -hmm. every supplement you can think of is now being put into gummy form because mm. more people will eat it that way, and then yeah. they sell more gummies. Uh huh. Yeah. See, even like 
like TikTok trends, like book talk, mm -hmm. social media trends where people are reviewing books on TikTok. So that that's good. Hey, at least TikTok isn't all like, you bad know, financial bad financial advice, bad financial advice and like weight issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. What else? So we talked about Reddit charts.com, trend hunter.com oh, yeah. or trend hunter.ai. This is kind of like more, I think more of just like a general, like you can search through different like consumer package goods and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, what else? And Trav, any other tools that you've used? Yeah, there's, there's, there's definitely some others out there. I mean, I think, uh, even just basic stuff like Google trends can be helpful sometimes if you, the only problem there is you kind of have to know what you're looking for. You have to have an idea and then you can kind of plug it in and see what the search volume looks like. Yep. So I'll often use that for brands. There, There's, for investors, there are things like sites like uh, App Annie, which is now called data.ai, I think, where you can find what apps are trending or what apps are gaining the most share in the app stores and things like that. So that's another way. Mm -hmm. But you can also go on your phone and look at the app stores and look at the rankings. You just have to remember to do it kind of consistently mm -hmm. yeah. every few days to kind of see what's trending. And uh, for instance, like you can see in, in fashion that like brands like Shein and what's the other one that popped up? Timu in the past like two years have basically dominated fashion, which puts pressure on brands like H&M and Gap and others. Forever 21. Yeah. So mm. those are trying. I know she Shein is, tw is a China company. So is Timu. Company. Nikki, yep. do you use um, Pinterest? I do. Yeah, I, I do use Pinterest trends. Okay, yeah. Trends.pinterest.com. You can come on here, see what the ladies are sharing up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's definitely uh, very niche. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, Answerthepublic.com. This is one that I recently found where you basically put in, like, let's just put in Bitcoin, and it creates a list of questions that people ask, mm. all right? So like you can see this like this wheel of questions like why Bitcoin was created, what Bitcoin wallet is oh. best, you know, like, so th this could also be good for like content creation for YouTubers and yeah, bloggers and stuff. I'm going to need to start using that one. Yeah, this is a, a pretty good one. Um, Data.ai, so try this is the one you were saying that um, shows you rankings of apps. Yeah, and it's a nice. paid product. So this is something that like an institutional investor or startups would would actually subscribe to. But mm -hmm. they do have a, a little bit of free data. If you sign up for a free account, you can get like 90 day history on on apps. And so sometimes I'll go in there and use the free tool just to kind of chart over the last 90 days. Like if I have a specific company in mind, let's say, let's say I'm looking at like Bumble, which is a public company. I'm like, okay, how has Bumble been doing in the app store in the dating category. And I can see kind of at least the last 90 days how it's trending, things like that. So sometimes it's helpful for that. And, and yeah, I, but yeah, there's, there are actually quite a few of these, you know, products in the institutional space where like hedge funds and firms that can in, invest tens of thousands of dollars will, they'll even get satellite tracking. They'll do, you know, all sorts of uh, crazy things with what we call alt data. And so there are firms like yip it data. So if you have the budget and you're, you know, an institution, you can go spend tens of thousands of dollars per month to get access to stuff like that. Uh, unfortunately, your your average individual retail yeah. investor not not can't really access that as much. Yep. Um, we use we use uh, some transcript services too, where you go talk to experts in the field and try to figure out what's happening on the ground. We did that a lot at the hedge fund too, but we subscribe to uh, a product called Tegas, and yep. there are others out there similar, but. What does Tegas give you, like um, a breakdown of interviewing like subject matter experts? Yeah, so hedge funds and private equity firms and and other people who are uh, who who want to speak to experts on the ground to figure out should they invest in X company, should they, you know, be in this industry, what do they need to watch out for? They go and Tegas sets up these interviews and finds the experts that they can talk to. So let's say I'm looking at the payments industry and I want to figure out what's happening with PayPal's market share. So they go out and find someone who was a VP at PayPal a year ago, or maybe they find someone who was a VP at a competing payments company and they set up an interview and that interview is transcribed in a PDF. So then anyone who subscribes to the platform, even if they weren't on that actual interview can read the transcript of the interview. And so you can get really good insights mm -hmm. into the state of an industry, what's happening, details about companies from the actual experts in those industries. Yeah. Nice. I've been using a lot, using it a lot for like my Pinterest research and my aesthetics industry research. And it's really cool to hear from like these insiders basically that have just so much knowledge. Well, give me an example of something that like a CFO might 
talk about in an industry. Yeah, and I'll give you an example. So, you know, I've I've spent a decent amount of time looking at the cannabis industry over the past two years and trying to understand it and understanding, for instance, public company weed maps, which the stock price has been completely demolished since it went public. And there were What's the co- ticker on that? Uh, maps, M A P S. Okay. And not to be confused with maps, which is also a crypto coin, because <laughs> I yeah. see on Twitter sometimes when I search maps, uh, it's just a bunch of crypto stuff. But the the weed maps company, one of the things that they're trying to do to grow the business is they're getting into like B2B. They want to not only be like a marketplace for consumers to find dispensaries, but they also want to be like a back end software for dispensaries themselves. They want to provide like analytics and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, that's that's super smart. Like weed maps has a good position in the industry. They should be able to do this well. But then you actually go and read the transcripts of the experts who know the industry who are working at like competitors of Weed Maps. And what they're saying is like Weed Maps is like a distant like number five or number six in B2B right now. And there are other companies like Metric and other companies like even uh, uh, I'm blanking. Uh, but there's there's another big one that's private. That's a private company. And they're just kicking Weed Maps ass in the whole B2B analytics back in cannabis software space. And so you're like, oh, OK, like I get that. Weed Maps is saying they want to get into this and that it could be a growth engine for them eventually, but right now they're getting their butts kicked and we shouldn't put any stock in in what management is saying about this. Mm-hmm. So very interesting because you wouldn't really get any of that if you're just reading the public transcripts and filings and things like that. That's awesome, man. Yeah, it's like a whole different level of just understanding what's happening behind whole the scenes. A whole different perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Man, I I love this stuff. Yeah. I mean, even like using our day-to-day lives for like market sentiment, right? Like market timing can also be helped like in crypto. And what was it? March, April or May of 2021 when crypto was in the bubble, got in an elevator. I heard two preteens talking about their NFT gains and I'm like, okay, this is, (laughs) this is crazy, right? So you can use it to find entries and early trends. You can also use it as a way to, I guess, know when things are stupid, right? Like when you're, what do they say? When, when your dentist is asking you for stock advice, that's a good time that, (laughs) that that you want to sell, right? What, what are some examples of, I guess, either research like that or like day-to-day stuff that you guys have seen where you're like, oh, now it's time to actually get out of something. Mm. Do you have one? I mean, yeah, I've, I've, again, using a lot of the the stuff we were just talking about, like, you know, talking to experts on the ground and, and figuring out the reality is very different than like what a management team is pitching. As mm. far as sentiment, though, is concerned, that's very interesting. I mean, you know, we monitor like a lot of signals, real time things like insider selling and other things like that to kind of get a gauge of like, well, what what are the people inside the company doing? Or if you see a lot of executive departures, if you see the CEO and the CFO all of a sudden leaving around the same time, there's things like that that we kind of use as signal for maybe maybe we need to at a minimum go investigate and figure out like uh, as far as like trend related um i do think you can often spot so we've been talking about trends as like a way to spot kind of the next thing but i do think it can be very powerful to use as figuring out like what what is eating the market share or what is going to be a headwind for a lot of companies and an example again maybe this beach just because this is top of mind but like paypal losing share to apple pay on mobile and not only can you see it in actual data but you could see it you know in things like google trend searches you'll see like the rise of apple pay versus paypal and things like that and so you can spot sometimes very real competitive headwinds and oftentimes the market sleeps on it for a while because you don't see it in the financials for maybe two or three or four years mm-hmm. and i think this could be the case with ai as well we haven't seen that many companies hurt by it that are public yet but i do think there will be some losers uh and so chegg was the first one that we saw gap down 50 percent, but we're we need to monitor, for instance, companies like Fiverr and Upwork. Not really seeing the financial impact yet, but in a couple quarters, are they going to be potentially impacted by AI removing fifty percent of the demand for graphic designers? And that's something I think that's on the radar because of some of the upticks in AI and AI products. And so you monitor that to kind of see if if there's going to be a real competitive threat that will eventually show up in the financials. It's a good point. I do remember using trends and kind of my surroundings to manage a trade in Bumble. It was like an investment. But I remember we were coming out of lockdowns 
And I ended up getting out of it because a lot of my friends who were single were telling me that they hated using the dating apps to date. Like they absolutely despised it. And they got off of them because they were like, screw this. I'm just going to meet somebody in real life. And we started to go back out again in the world and go to restaurants and go out to eat and stuff. So I remember cutting my position in Bumble. I was like, you know, there's probably a, different, a better place for this capital. I don't know if I'm feeling this anymore with the anecdotal evidence of, you know, the people around me that just aren't digging dating apps anymore. Mm. And we're going back out in the world. So people are going to be meeting people in person again. So that that was kind of a, a, a surrounding, I took that, you know, evidence around me and and used it to kind of use that make that decision on exiting bumble so that's probably the closest example that i can come up with i guess something like that too could be more difficult also to use because anecdotally i know several people that met their wives or husbands too right like yeah but bumble was women focused bumble is where the women the woman Woman has all the decisions and i was talking to women Okay. So, at granted, of course, tons of people still use Bumble. I think they're probably still, I think they're still doing good. I haven't Why, why looked, was this a, it but, looks to me like a busted IPO. Like, it is, what, yeah. Why is the chart such dog shit? Well, Bumble's a strange company because it has two parts of the business. It has the core Bumble business, which has been doing fine. But it also has a, a second business, Badu, which is like a an app that was heavily used in a lot of European countries and uh Brazil and a few countries that are not in North America. And so I think, believe it was Blackstone had bought a big stake in Bumble when it was private, combined it with Badu um, and created this like zombie company kind of or Frankenstein company that had these two different businesses. And the Badu business has really been the anchor weighing down overall Bumble. Is it the same idea or is it a totally different experience? It's a totally different experience and they're essentially shrinking. The other thing with Bumble is it hasn't been managed super well in the past year or two, in my opinion. I also think it was a little bit overvalued at IPO. So uh, it, it probably does have some upside from here. But, you know, one interesting thing talking about trends is you could have seen the rise of Hinge, like even I think oh, yeah. two years ago, you saw Hinge on the rise in the App Store rankings. If you look at Google trend searches, you would have seen Hinge on the come up. And I, I believe Hinge has surpassed Bumble and in at least in some months has surpassed Tinder as well as the top dating app. In the app is stores. Public? Yeah, so Hinge is actually part of Match Group, which owns Tinder as well. Match. M- uh, MTCH. MTCH. Oh, there we go. Now, interestingly, MTCH is also near a 52-week low. Oh, yeah. They've gotten decimated. Because I would probably rather own Match than Bumble. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I like Match's core properties like Hinge and Tinder. Uh, they also monetize a little bit better. I think the management team is a little bit more focused on shareholder returns, but it's a bigger company has debt on the balance sheet. So it's, there's some trade-offs there for sure. But, but yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting though, because you can see some of the, you could see like the rise of hinge definitely impacting Bumble's growth. And that has, has also played out in Bumble's share price. There's also a lot of competition in the industry. That was another thing I was noticing is they they're kept there, there were new things popping up. Like mm-hmm. every day I would hear about this new thing, even the Facebook. or Facebook. Yeah, or there or... was this thing where they were going to meet in person and they were going to like release these secret dates where everybody single goes and they meet each other in person. Like all these new things were coming up and even Facebook was trying to get into the dating industry. And I remember just thinking, I'm just going to wipe my hands of this. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just flooded. and Yeah. And like, you know, things change and yeah. you make those decisions. When that, you... That's also like a good point of like finding trends early, right? Like if you were early invested in Tinder or whatever the first movers were, that's much better than now after these big boom and bust patterns with so much competition trying yeah. to step in. It's like, who's going to win? It's a, it's a coin toss. That's that's what a lot of times I try to do is find like trends, like just new categories and new ideas early, like Bitcoin 2013, right? Like the ultimate yes, early trend. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like find completely new ideas really early, right? That That's where my mind is, is like not trying to pick up, as we call them in crypto, like table scraps. Like if you have an altcoin that's been through a big bust pattern it's like will the price come back maybe but there's a lot of bag holders and there might be a new flavor of this market cycle i would much rather be in on something new than trying to pick up litecoin or some shit that's been through cycles and has proven it's not really going anywhere i will say there is something especially in the 
in the public stock world to to the whole like Lindy effect or or the concept of something being Lindy, which is like it 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 is timeless. And so there are certain things in certain industries and companies that really almost seem to never get disrupted. Maybe even things like waste management companies, oh, yeah. right? Like who's mm-hmm. going to disrupt companies that own a bunch of trash trucks and have trash service? You know, there's only like two or three big ones yeah. in most places or you Coke. Know, a Coke or Dude, luxury goods. So I got to ask Louis you, I got to tell you, I got to tell you a story and then ask you a question about Coke. Okay, look. We're looking at Coke's like five ish year chart. Oh, KO is actually the, because I think that might be the bottler. Oh, yeah. Okay. There's like the KO. brand KO is like Coca Cola, the company that has like right. the actual. So both both stocks, whether we're looking at the bottler or, or the Coca Cola company, mm-hmm. both stocks have been doing well, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I saw uh, something on Reddit the other day that just talking about trends or anti trends. Um, it was a guy who owned, I think, a, a a small like boutique grocery store and he posted a sign that said, Hey, Coke has doubled or tripled their prices this year. They're basically, it's unprofitable for grocery stores to hold the product anymore. So therefore we moved it over here and we've increased our supply of Pepsi and whatever the other knockoff brands were. Mm. And I was like, yeah, Coke has had, I don't know, do you call it a moat or something with their formula? And they've, they've had worldwide distribution and Warren Buffett said that's a stock I think he's never going to sell. Mm-hmm. And like, yeah, something like that is interesting though. Like you've got the stock doing well, but they're blaming inflation for having to ba- – I forget what the numbers were, but it was basically, I'm going to make these numbers up. It went from like 99 cents for a, a pack of something or a two liter bottle to like 250 or three bucks. They basically doubled or tripled very quickly. And like, how do they maintain that if say Pepsi and the other knockoffs aren't raising their prices so big? And is that like a counter trend play? Yeah, very, very interesting. A couple, couple thoughts come to mind here because I was even looking at PepsiCo results not that long ago, and they were taking way more price than inflation. So all these consumer goods companies basically used this inflationary period to hike prices even more than inflation. Yeah. And so now their results, sure. especially as some of the commodity costs are coming back in, now their results are just like looking gangbusters. Yeah, because corporate profits are like at all-time highs, right? Especially for, yeah, these CPG companies. But on the other hand— with Coca-Cola, we've always believed that it has this mode and that it, you know, it's, it's, you know, it taps into like all these emotions and, you know, it's addicting because it's got caffeine and sugar or whatever. But is there a point at which it stops being Lindy, so to speak? Is it, mm-hmm. is there a point at which the tide finally turns against sugary beverages? Yes. Gen Z. Yeah. And, and, and the health movement. Could that be happening now? So like, could this be setting up for, you know, an all time great short bet against it, you know, for a longer term bet. Maybe. The only problem, of course, with Coke and Pepsi is that they own a ton of different they, brands. Yeah, it's they like own a like, conglomerate. Yeah. They own like water brands. They own Gatorade yeah. brand. They, you know, they own, uh, you know, in PepsiCo's case, of course, like Frito-Lay products and all these other things. And They've acquired some of the trending healthier beverages. Yeah, yeah it's much so. easier for them to just acquire or move into that space yeah. than a tiny person tried to battle the incumbents. So exactly. maybe, maybe they do have a moat. <laughs> yeah. Now they're too big to fail. They can just move into any market they want, you know, yeah. any beverage they they want that's trending. Well, look, Coke used to have cocaine in it, right? <laughs> and now it has caffeine and sugar. Maybe the future is like actually healthy shit, not diet Coke, which has proven to be pretty bad. Yeah. Um. All right, cool. So listen, I think the the idea here is like if you're an investor or a trader or an entrepreneur, like I would, I think that looking at trends and having that as part of your routine makes a lot of sense. One, it's really fun. Two, it can help you make a lot of money. Any other final thoughts on that kind of topic before we move on? You know, sometimes being early to a trend is uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and you question yourself, but you just got to stick with it and, you know, be, be confident in your research, be confident in what you're looking at. And until the data tells you differently, you know, but it can be uncomfortable in the beginning. Yeah, that's a good point. Like you said, Trav, I mean, especially in the public markets, if you notice something, it could be it takes time months, sometimes. quarters, or years before the market actually wakes up and realizes it. Yeah. Yes. Hunter, 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 hunter. Hunt it. <laughs> All right, cool. A uh, quick couple of questions and then we will wrap it up. Uh, Raz was asking, how do you determine whether a position is a short term trade or a long term hold? Oh. How, how do you guys quantify that? Hmm. Well, for me, 
like Abercrombie and Fitch is a good example. This is actually one that I found in 2017 for a turnaround of the Abercrombie brand, which now it's turned around officially Notice today. Notice the trend early. Notice the trend early. Yeah. It was painful for a little bit. Now everyone's all like, oh my God, Abercrombie's comping 14%. I'm like, I told y'all. It's up like 20% today, <laughs> yeah, right? And yeah. And so, uh, you know, I think that you kind of know when you're going into something, the way you do the research and the way you're looking at the opportunity like for me, I knew Abercrombie was going to be a very, very many years, you know, for this turnaround. And once they turn it around, then, you know, then maybe the hockey stick happens. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to trade the moves in and out. But um, I hold a core investing position on this because I want to I think the company long term has the opportunity. So a lot of deciding between short term and long term comes from the research, right? Like what a what are you? What are you trying to do with this research? Are you looking for something that's going to compound over the next 10 years, you know, a multi-year compounder, or are you just looking for a short, quick profits? So it kind of depends on the goal, but you can also do both within one ticker or within one investment, similar yeah. to what you do with Bitcoin. Yeah, for right? sure. And like with Bitcoin, yeah, I have a core investment and I also take trades. In and out of it. When yeah. it comes to altcoins, almost all altcoins, I are, I'm doing short-term trades to accumulate more fiat or more Bitcoin. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think there are characteristics of long-term investments that differ from short-term trades. And especially when I look at a lot of shorter-term trades for me might be special situations, quick turnarounds. Maybe there's a, a catalyst, a specific catalyst that happens in a very given time frame. And if it happens, you know, I take the trade, I exit with a win. If it doesn't play out, I exit with a loss, whatever. But on the long-term side, I'm looking for those, those companies that can be staples in the portfolio for years to come. And those are typically going to have characteristics like a really good shareholder focused management team. <clears throat> Do they make consistently good decisions about capital allocation, share repurchases, not taking on too much debt, not doing dumb acquisitions? There are some industries and some companies where you just can never get comfortable making it a core long term position because you don't trust the people running it mm -hmm. to run it for shareholders. And that's why when you look at Buffett, he's done so well because he's been able to identify core positions that he holds for decades you know, your Coca-Colas, your Geico's, your uh, in in recent years, he's owned, um, you know, some of some of the like apples. The, yeah, Apple. Exactly. Like, so that's kind of what I look for as well. And of course, like there's some tax considerations as well, because if I've owned a position for 11 months and I'm about to hit long term capital gains, I'm probably going to hold that a little longer uh, at a minimum. So. So, yeah, looking for characteristics of companies that can generate consistent growth, consistent returns for shareholders. Those are going to be in my safe long-term bucket that I'm comfortable that I get really comfortable holding for longer periods of times. So even, even if there's some volatility in quarterly results or the share price has corrections, willing to hold those. Mm -hmm. Dropbox being a good example for me in the past couple of years, stock hasn't really done a whole lot, but it's been a pretty solid, safe holding. And when I buy at the right times, it does well. And I still think there's long-term upside, but there, there are certain things where you don't want to be in it for more than just a trade. Yes. Plenty of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No one to get in and get out, trade the momentum. And, and that's the stuff that's more technical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it comes down to technicals versus fundamentals. What are you paying attention to? Good well point. Said. Well said. All right, guys. Well, uh, we're going on an hour, so we'll wrap it up there. But um, I think we're through earnings. We still got the debt ceiling thing. Any other things you guys are looking at? Well, earnings is just starting for me because it's retail. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so that's like right. Lulu's got still has to report, and yep. we got a bunch of retailers today that reported. So um, for me, it's like uh, going to be busy over the next week. Busy time. Nice. I still think, besides the debt ceiling, we still have this whole issue. The Fed speakers were out in full force this week, acting like they're going to keep raising interest rates, which is wild absolutely yeah, Bullard wild. was saying two rate hikes yeah oh, yeah mortgage rates are back at seven percent mortgage yeah. rates at seven again stocks kind of sleepwalking through the fact that even even in the yield curve which has been calling the fed's bluff even the yield curve which has been saying for months and months that the fed actually needs to start cutting soon even the yield curve actually sent bond yields back up 30 or 40 basis points in the past 10 days or so and stocks sort of ignored it for the first time in a while. Very surprising to me that stocks are not reacting negatively to all this Fed speak, to yields rising. So that's something I'm going to be watching very close over the next few weeks. Again, I'm in the whole camp that says Fed has already done too much. If they hike any more, in fact, I think they've already hiked too much. If they hike any more, 
uh, T bills and chill for me times ten. Like I'm, yeah. I, I'm out. I'm out, y'all. I, I, I will I, say this: <laughs> the Abercrombie comp for Asia Pacific was pretty damn strong. Yeah. So I don't know if maybe the stock market could be holding on to the China reopening. I'm not saying the economy is doing poorly yet. But I'm saying the Fed is going to ensure that the economy does poorly if they keep on the totally, path. totally. They're they're, yeah. just, they're making the opposite mistake of what they did a year and a half, two years ago when we were like screaming at them, "Why are you doing QE with rates at zero when inflation is rising?" And now it's like inflation is dropping and it's going to drop even more. And you're talking about more rate hikes. Like, what are you doing? Yeah, and the I mean the market kind of believes that there's a 28 percent probability of a hike. That's that's crazy. Yeah, I agree. So mm. I'll be watching this very closely, the Fed and rates over the next, well, really probably over the summer, but awesome. All right, guys, we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. Um, go to wetalkmoney.com to submit a question for the show. Nikki, you want to talk about the community? Yes. So you can get access to all of us in the community, all of our research, and uh, come into our weekly updates, stock market update. You do the big, uh, crypto update every week. You can get half off of your first month's subscription with the promo code build wealth, all one word, lowercase, so build wealth. We talk money.com forward slash community, use build wealth, get half off your first month or quarter. Yep. And we'll see you in the Discord group and in the live classes. And if we don't talk to you before then, we'll see you guys next week in the next episode. Ciao. Take care, guys. Cheers.